Welcome to episode 5 of the Diplomacy Light podcast. We continue our mini-series on the Biological Weapons Convention with a focus on Article 5 of the Convention. The second ever BWC consultative process organized under this article will be held in Geneva on 27th of July 2022, the day after this episode of the podcast airs, with the first such consultative process taking place in 1997. This episode, following the spirit of this podcast, will only discuss the technical aspects of this article and the process it invokes. Article 5 of the BWC draws inspiration from Article 5 of the 1969 Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, or the NPT, as well as Article 3 of the 1971 Seabed Treaty. Other international instruments that have come after the BWC have similar articles. Article 9 in the Chemical Weapons Convention, Article 4 in the CTBT, Article 8 of the Ottawa Convention. Our guest today, Dr. James Revel, authored a United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research, or UNIDAIR, study specifically on this article in the BWC ahead of the eighth review conference. The study notes around 30 other legal instruments that have such a consultative process envisioned. The idea behind the article is clear in the language, to provide a predictable process of consultation between states' parties on issues and problems that may arise, and to hopefully cooperate in resolving them. There can be bilateral consultations between two states, as well as multilateral, where all parties are invited to participate. My discussion with James started while we were both in Vienna a few weeks ago for the first regional meeting in preparation to the ninth review conference, which is planned for later this year. We recorded there the first part in person. The viewers will forgive the bad lightning, while the listeners the background noise. We then continue recording through a virtual platform. And James is the right person to help us understand how Article 5 works in the BWC. He's the head of the Weapons of Mass Destruction Program at the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research. His research focus, starting with his PhD, is on the evolution of chemical and biological weapons and the conventions that regulate them. His full bio is available in a link below. Diplomacy Live Broadcast. Well, thanks a lot for uh, having this conversation with uh, me. We just got out of a meeting on the Biological Weapons Convention. Um, and obviously there's a lot of different aspects within uh, the uh, convention itself, a lot of different articles with different uh, uh, areas uh, that they address. But specifically, um, if we could uh, talk a little bit about Article 5, I think it's uh, one that is not very often uh, discussed, uh, but it, uh, uh, it's certainly one that is quite important. So if I may start with a brief description, if you could give us, of the reasoning behind the consultation and the cooperation uh, that is uh, at the core uh, of this article. And this is not, the, the, the BWC is not the only convention or multilateral treaty that, that has such an article. So uh, a, a broad kind of uh, logic, uh, uh, if you could. And then specifically within the Biological Weapons Convention, is there something specific about the life sciences that would make such a consultation and cooperation process different than perhaps in other legal instruments? I mean, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to be able to, to join you on the podcast. And in terms of Article 5 and, and consultation, clarification, cooperation mechanisms more generally, I think at the time of negotiation, these sorts of tools were, were seen as useful and it has drawn from other treaties. But it's a useful means to address issues that may emerge which were perhaps not fully considered in the negotiation of the Convention. And these things happen. I mean, there will be changes or challenges that emerge, so having these tools can be extremely valuable. In the case of the BWC, the Biological Weapons Convention, I think there's an additional value here because of the dual-use nature of the life sciences. So many of the materials, the expertise, the, the equipment associated with uh, biological weapons is primarily there for peaceful purposes, but can also be exploited for hostile purposes too. So there's an ambiguity around some of these issues. So having these, these channels through which you can have a discussion to try and resolve some of these ambiguities, I think, is, is really important. Uh, in, in terms of the, the article itself, uh, there's a couple of points on this. I think it, 
it's broad in its scope, so it covers all the articles of the Biological Weapons Convention, but also the preamble, uh, the preamble paragraphs as well. So it really kind of covers the entirety of the convention, any issues that arise in the implementation. So it's quite broad. It's also quite flexible, and I think in the second sentence it talks about sort of international procedures for additional assistance, which I think are, are underexploited. There's latent potential there for the provision of specialised assistance without necessarily needing to go to the UN Security Council and having that veto risk. So I think there's a lot of potential there. Oh, excellent. We uh, are obviously on a bit of a... Um, press with time, you have to hit catch a flight in a little bit, and uh, I wanted to take this opportunity to start this conversation uh, with um, Jamie before uh, we could uh, adjourn and continue it though, uh, the first opportunity, uh, and uh, perhaps even have less of uh, uh, background noises. And, uh, uh, that, that would be useful. So, thanks a lot for starting this conversation. I think it's a, an important one. I look forward to continuing with you. Likewise, it's good to talk. Thank Cheers. You. Jamie, we're uh, taking this conversation up um, in uh, an alternate format, uh, uh, in an online format. Uh, you and I are, are fans of uh, a hybrid approach in an other area for which I would like to invite you even right now on the S&T, the Science and Technology Review Mechanism of the BWC. Um, so hybrid is something that uh, perhaps uh, you and I uh, see as a beneficial in, in the BWC process. But to come back to the Article 5 uh, conversation that, that we started, um, could you perhaps go into a little bit more detail uh, on the two clauses that are a part of uh, the article. So the article basically says that to undertake uh, to consult bilaterally and multilaterally, which is the first clause, and then the second clause, and cooperate in solving any problems which may arise in relation to the objective or in the application of the BWC. So perhaps these are even two subclauses to the second clause, the objective and the application. Could you uh, perhaps just go into more detail uh, around these clauses? Yeah, I think the first thing to draw your attention to is really the, the breadth of Article 5 consultation. So this may consider any problems that may arise in relation to the objective of or in the application of the provisions of the Convention. It's a slightly clunky phrasing, but my understanding is that, that was developed in order to cover both all the articles of the BWC, but also some of those preambular paragraphs as well, which is particularly important as it allows you to touch upon use issues as well. So this potentially really is, as, as uh, I think, Nick Sims remarked, it's as wide as the convention itself, which is quite useful. On, on the, the second aspect, on the appropriate international procedures within the framework of the United Nations, I think this is quite important. And if you look across the evolution of Article 5 through different review conferences, it's become increasingly clear that this could refer to the Security Council, but it could also embrace other UN machinery. And it really suggests to me that there is a degree of latent potential in Article 5, and this is something which states parties have reaffirmed in the past. So the second and the third review conferences agreed that any states party may request specialised assistance in solving any problems which may arise in relation to the objective of or in the application of the provisions of the Convention. And this includes through appropriate international procedures. That statement is, is quite important because it, it permits any state's party to at least initiate some sort of perhaps even investigative process through the use of specialised assistance without the threat of formal veto, which would be the case under Article 6 of the Convention. So it, it's quite an interesting uh, potential for, for using that uh, process as well. Uh, it's a couple of other things over the course of the evolution. For what is quite a, a short article, uh, the review conferences, but particularly the second and the third review conferences, have really sort of developed this and drawn it out a little bit through, for example, uh, establishing and elaborating a timeline for the convening of both an informal procedural meeting, uh, which is 30 days, and then a formal consultative meeting, which my understanding is it has to take place within 60 days of the receipt of, of the request. Uh, other details from the third review conference covers things such as the financing of uh, an Article 5 consultative meeting, indicating the cost of this will be met by states parties participating in accordance with the United Nations assessment scale, the standard processes which is used. So these, the, these review conferences have really sort of developed and drawn out the procedures for this, but 
particularly uh, the, the second and third in uh, 1986 and 1991, respectively, really put some, a flash on, on the bones of Article 5, which I think is quite useful. It, in, in terms of uh, the uh, segments of uh, the progress and how such a process would go, um, it would seem a bit more uh, logical to start perhaps an Article 5 consultation within the BWC uh, framework and then to take it to, to the Security Council. Now we have actually right now, tomorrow, uh, the second ever uh, consultative process, and it has gone the other way around. It has started within the Security Council and has had discussions, uh, and it is, it is now um, uh, uh, coming back to the, to, coming to the BWC uh, for a, a discussion. Um, is there um, some, uh, danger of perhaps uh, uh, introducing some ambiguity in this process uh, when, when it is taken uh, in, in such a manner. Um, and perhaps to go into the latent potential that you mentioned, uh, would the, the alternative to the Security Council be the UN Secretary General's mechanism or an other, other mechanisms? What exactly is that latent potential that exists? So, in terms of the the um, UN Secretary General's mechanism, uh, this primarily focuses on addressing issues with alleged use. So, there are limitations as to how that the mandate of that entity could be brought to bear uh, on more recent allegations. In terms of the Article Five procedures, there is another alternative, which could be to invoke Article Six of the Biological Weapons Convention, but that is subject to Security Council veto, and in the current political geostrategic context. It is possible um, that there, there will be a veto requirement push there, although it may not be the case. So with, with Article 5, you do have that potential without the Security Council, Council veto, which I think is important. In terms of the procedure, I think there is some shared understanding that this sort of process would normally begin with a bilateral consultation, but that's not a sort of written in stone expectation. I think it took... Uh, was something which has been referred to in, in past additional understandings under the um, at review conferences. Uh, but, but it's states' prerogative as to how they wish to use this. And I think it, it does come with a certain degree of responsibility of invoking Article 4. So before we go into what is currently uh, taking place in the consultative uh, Article 5 process that is uh, planned to take place tomorrow, uh, the day after the airing of, of this podcast, um, can you perhaps drive us through the past examples of when it has been used, both in terms of a bilateral and multilateral, because both are envisioned uh, within the article. Uh, what ha how has it been used in the past and what have been its effects? Okay. Yeah. So it's perhaps useful to, to distinguish between sort of bilateral use of, uh, of Article 5 and then multilateral usage. In terms of bilateral usage, by the second review conference in 1986, it was clear that some states had invoked Article 5 consultations uh, bilaterally and with a limited degree of success, I think it's fair to say. So, for example, we can see how the, the US had unsuccessfully engaged in bilateral consultations with the Soviet Union in relation to things like Sverdlovsk. Um, and, and a couple of other allegations around the time. Uh, the, my understanding of this is that the, the procedures under Article 5 bilaterally were, were unable to successfully resolve uh, the, those issues at that time. And certainly the Soviet Union was critical of the consultations and saw this as an attempt to undermine uh, the BWC. So you have examples there from some of the records, not that any of them, but uh, that there are some records, uh, record recordings of those, those early uses. Perhaps more significantly for the current discussion is the use of Article 5 in multilateral form in 1997. And this followed Cuban allegation that it had been the target of biological aggression by the United States um, and followed the appearance of Thrips Palmy in Cuba. Um, 
the, the US denied this charge, it's sort of outrageous, uh, I think was the phrase that was used. But nonetheless, uh, Cuba requested that Russia, as a co-depository, convene a consultative meeting in accordance with the procedures that were agreed at the third review conference. And correspondingly, Russia proceeded with, with informal consultations with the co-depositories as per agreed procedures. And then the arrangement of an informal meeting of interested states parties to discuss the arrangements for, for what would be a formal consultative meeting. That informal process, my understanding is that it was largely a procedural meeting uh, at which it was agreed that the dates for the formal consultative meeting were, were agreed. Then at the formal consultative meeting, uh, the, the process, as I understand it, was that Cuba and the United States were given 30 minutes to make statements to present their evidence, and drawing indeed on quite a lot of scientific um, information and, and sources, the text of which and that information was subsequently circulated to states parties as well. Then both parties were given space to make additional statements in order to be able to amplify some of the points they raised in, in their formal statements in the first half hour. The, the formal meeting closed on the 27th of August in, in 1997, but it also agreed that the Bureau should continue to hold additional meetings to over the course of the rest of the year to complete its work. And I think it's perhaps worth just going through some of these. So I think there were three that were held in total. The first of these um, agreed that uh, observations could be submitted to Cuba and the US, um, and there's an additional offer of further meetings as well. The second meeting, uh, there was a sort of response from Cuba and the US to these additional observations that were submitted. I think there's about a dozen in total. And then at the third and the final meeting, which took place in December 97, there was an agreement on the report. The report itself uh, kind of reflects the, the, the discussion in that some felt there was no causal link between the, <coughs> the overflight of a US plane and then the, the infestation, uh, the insect infestation in Cuba. Others felt that the, the technical complexity of the issue was such that uh, it was impossible to draw sort of definitive conclusions. The report itself concluded that due to technical, the technical complexity of the subject and the passage of time, uh, it was not possible to reach a definitive conclusion with regard to the concerns raised by the government of Cuba. Uh, so that's the, the sort of process for the, the multilateral experience in 1997. So in absence of a verification protocol, the, the famous discussion within the BWC at any given moment, um, to have this consultative process perhaps adds uh, a little uh, teeth or uh, a little um, an, another instrument in terms of ensuring compliance of all states parties with the the convention. Uh, what would be uh, your thinking in terms of does this process strengthen or weaken the norm uh, against the use and uh, stockpiling and uh, uh, development, etc., uh, and especially if it is not used specifically to really uncover, really to consult and cooperate, but rather perhaps more of a, uh, an information smearing campaign. Um, does the process itself, the, the the fact that it exists and that it allows for this possibility, do you think strengthen or does it weaken the norm when uh, it's really not substantial or substantiated? Yeah, so I mean, just in terms of the experience in, in 97, the process successfully fulfilled the obligations under Article 5, and I think there was general agreement that, that it had done its, the process was followed successfully. In addition, uh, discussions with, with people in the past on this indicated that states were able to have their say, and I think under somebody using the phrase, honour was served. And to some extent, states were able to get back to business as usual in, in that particular case. Um, I say to some extent. Moreover, Cuba chose not to pursue any of the possible follow up procedures, uh, as some states in their observations uh, suggest it might be useful. So they could have, for example, gone to the, the World Meteorological Organization or the Food and Agricultural Organization. But they, they chose not to do that. Uh, and so, to some extent, it allowed the, the allegation to be, for want of a, a sort of slightly cliche phrase, to be put to bed, to be able to. to um, for states to be able to move on to some extent. In addition, I think Nicholas Sims has identified a couple of things that helped that consultative mechanism, which I think 
perhaps useful to consider as well. Those include the, the importance of having a geographically representative set of vice chairs um, in the Bureau, as this provides a degree of collective legitimization of the process. The second point he raises was having a one month time limit for the submission of additional observations from states, which he thought was a helpful process. And then the third was the inviting the two states in dispute to comment on some of the observations submitted. So essentially, this creates a second round of comments, which I think adds add to the process. I think perhaps one of the important, perhaps key lessons learned from this is that Article 5 multilateral formal consultative processes alone are unlikely to resolve a compliance issue in a sort of cohesive manner, particularly in the context of, of geostrategic tension. So I think it's important to sort of manage expectations as to what these can achieve. So this is perhaps a good segue into a broader consideration of what are lessons learned from this process. Uh, we will perhaps have a, a better idea of the lessons learned uh, after tomorrow's meeting and, and, and see how, how that goes. Uh, but what, what are uh, the key lessons that, that we've learned uh, in, in the past uses uh, within the Biological Weapons Convention? But perhaps even if you, if you can like, uh, share how that it goes in, in other uh, regimes, perhaps uh, the Chemical Weapons uh, Convention, uh, uh, the IAEA. Uh, so, it, it, how how has how have these processes uh, helped the conventions and the norms behind them? Thanks. It's, it's a good question. This is not the first time we've had acrimonious allegations related to biological or chemical weapons, as you know, uh, nor will it be the last. There's a sort of long history of these allegations, some of which are more credible than others, I think it's fair to say. And indeed, I, to paraphrase the, the late great Julian Perry Robinson, these allegations of association with biological and chemical weapons have been used unwittingly or unscrupulously for centuries as a means to, to vilify enemies. Um, so there, there is this sort of long history of these things. And to me, it really points to the importance of having measures and procedures to address concerns and uh, in many ways prevent any sort of frivolous allegations. I, I think we, we need to be, as I said before, to manage expectations as to, as to what any future users will do. A formal multilateral consultative meeting is, is unlikely to reach a sort of unequivocal outcome. This wasn't the case in ninety seven. Uh, I think also we, there is the possibility that we may end up in uncharted territory with the use of the follow up, for example, on appropriate international procedures within the framework of the United Nations. It's not something which is done before in the BWC context. Of course, if we look across to mechanisms such as the Chemical Weapons Convention, we can see that in the context of Syria, uh, the OPCW has to some extent demonstrated a degree of, of flexibility to find pragmatic solutions based on the Chemical Weapons Convention, but, but to find these sort of approaches when the normal mechanisms of the Chemical Weapons Convention weren't available or weren't suited for, for various reasons. But it's also clear from this experience that there are risks to the sort of more for want of a better phrase, ad hoc type approaches. And that there's a risk that with flexibility and adaptability, uh, that when standards are proof, when methods are not necessarily agreed by all states parties or have to be agreed quite quickly, there is a risk they could be more vulnerable to challenge, um, depending on the, the specific interests of, of states parties, particularly when you have powerful state interests in, in particular outcome or particular point being pressed. And you could certainly envisage that in, in the current climate. I think there are also probably going to be some practical challenges as well, but I'm happy to, to talk about that further as, as you wish. Oh, please, go ahead. No, I mean, at, at the moment, we have a situation in very but in quite a dull way, there's issues with conference room availability, there's issues with finances in the BWC, which is a long-standing challenge. And we're looking at the sort of event which is coming in what is quite an intense period of in the arms control and disarmament calendar with a lot of things going on as, the, the, um, as, as COVID has sort of resulted in the condensing of arms control and disarmament related meetings. Um, it also has potential implications for the review conference in November. Um, past review conferences have managed to navigate compliance allegations. So the first, the second, the fourth review conferences all managed to kind of deal with these by, 
by recognizing these in the discussion, but trying to avoid having them in the final review doc, final document that emerges. So there have been ways to manage this. And, and in some ways, we have this Article 5 proceeding. It is there. It is an explicit part of the text. It's, it, it should, in many ways, be used when there are these, these sort of situations that arise to resolve ambiguities, to address concerns. That's what it's designed to do. But it, there is it's perhaps optimistic, though, at the moment that, that this will be able to insulate the review conference. And there is a possibility that it could lend momentum to allegations and create further challenges for the review conference. And this is something which has been raised by um, colleagues in academia and civil society elsewhere. But at the same time, it, it, it is an explicit part of the convention that's designed to address problems uh, with the implementation of the objectives of the BWC. Thanks. Um... It seems to me that within biological warfare, um, there is uh, a greater potential than in any other area um, where information, misinformation, disinformation can have dangerous uh, consequences when, when used as part of this infor information warfare. Um, in a previous podcast, the uh, uh, podcasts, the third and fourth, uh, I had a conversation uh, uh, as you know, with uh, with Matthew Messelson, with John Walker, with uh, Sergei Batsanov. And we considered how there is a dangerous blurring of the line uh, when we're talking about biological weapons uh, between war and peace. Uh, and that, that is a very dangerous development. Uh, I think that it's also present in cyber uh, to, to some degree. But I think in, in, in biological, it's uh, much more uh, evident and with possible uh, dangerous consequences uh, of it. As an arms control and disarmament expert, uh, what do you think about uh, this? Uh, the, the, the effect of information, disinformation, specifically uh, within this field, relative to other, perhaps, weapons of mass destruction? Information misinformation is, is not a new challenge within this field, but it's something that I think has become much more acute with in the sort of digital age the, and the, the speed at which narratives can be disseminated amongst like-minded groups, I think, has picked up considerably. And I think this, this does have implications. In, in the case of bio, I think you're right. It, it is particularly challenging because it's difficult enough to determine whether something is natural or deliberate, yet alone begin to attribute responsibility in the case that something is done deliberately. So there is a real challenge there, and there is always likely to be, or, or, there will most likely be a degree of uncertainty in, in the evidence available in, in looking at any particular case. I'm talking hypothetically here, of course, the point being, it's not easy. And I think that uncertainty creates space for counter narratives, for misinformation, for disinformation, whether it's done unwittingly or unscrupulously. I think there's, there's a real challenge there. But for me, I think it really does point to the, the increasing importance of work to strengthen the Biological Weapons Convention later this year at the Ninth Review Conference. We, we really do, despite the difficulties, despite the the difficult geostrategic context in particular, the review conference really does provide a unique opportunity to advance the Biological Weapons Convention and to do so at a point where the, the science of relevance to biological weapons is advancing considerably. The, the research landscape for biotechnology and biology has, has changed considerably with more actors in more institutions around the world undertaking research that is almost overwhelmingly for peaceful purposes, but could be could be exploited for hostile purposes as well. So I think trying to look at what is possible in terms of building confidence and compliance with the BWC, I, I think is, is really important now, particularly taking advantage of not just looking at technological risks, but technological opportunities as well. And I think there's, there's not been a significant discussion in that area for nearly 30 years now. So I think engaging with those topics again, could unlock or identify potential areas where we may not get to verification, 100% foolproof verification, but it may be possible to have greater confidence in compliance with the convention than we currently do. Whether states, but whether states bodies are think that is enough is, is a decision for them. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, that's a, a great way to uh, end our conversation. This consultative process uh, taking place for the second time ever uh, is taking place in a review conference here. 
Uh, it's not connected uh, directly to the review conference process, the negotiations leading up to it, but it's inevitable that it will have uh, an effect uh, on it. Um, aside other uh, possible uh, consequences on the uh, process leading up to the review conference, specifically within the Article 5 uh, framework, do you think um, it is possible to have some additional understandings uh, on this that would strengthen specifically Article 5, so specifically the consultative uh, cooperative uh, process. Um, what would be your dream scenario? What is a more realistic scenario? Uh, where What's in between? And so for, for Article 5, additional understandings of the ninth review conference specifically, I, I think it's perhaps worth bearing in mind in 2016, and no doubt several other review conferences prior to that, but certainly in 2016, there were working papers, I think, from the EU and the US, which sought to kind of develop the, the provisions under Article 5. That includes the potentially considering a role for the implementation support unit as a sort of, as a as a timekeeper, um, amongst other things, but, but to try and update that a little bit, and also to reaffirm some of those um, developments, those additional understandings agreed in the second and third review conference as well. I think what what is required is some sort of this escalating ladder through which concerns can be addressed, and perhaps Article Five could be operationalized not just in sort of uh, high consequence, uh, politically sensitive issues as we're seeing now, but but actually more routinely used to address ambiguities, to address concerns that may emerge. CBMs are often submitted with, with the best, not often, but are submitted with the best of intentions, but there may be some things which could be interpreted or could, could be wrong accidentally or errors creeping into CBMs. So often having a... Building. So measures, com confidence to... building measures. Yeah, it's, so having a space to just to, to sort of clarify some of those and address any concerns. I think having this tool is useful to avoid concerns festering and avoid them becoming exacerbated over time. And, uh, and in many cases, it may be just a really innocent misunderstanding. So being able to use the tool and this sort of escalating series of functions beginning a sort of bilateral mode informally to address concerns and then perhaps having a more formal bilateral process then escalating in, into as the sort of multilateral mode where, where required and then having some clarification on what happens if that second clause is invoked i think i think could also be useful a little bit more detail and planning on that because you don't want to be kind of trying to develop these things in the face of a difficult politically sensitive challenge, um, in some cases that it, it does potentially create loopholes and vulnerabilities if you're trying to do things on the fly as opposed to agreeing things ahead of any event. So yeah, some sort of clarity and that would be a useful outcome and as part of a wider package of, of measures, which is kind of addresses the interests of all states parties. And that includes measures on, for example, international cooperation, maybe something that we've discussed several times before on the science and technology review mechanism, maybe looking again at some of the science and technology of relevance to as to say verification, but building confidence in compliance, drawing on some of the, the tools and the developments since Verex in 92 and 93, which I think is something that John Walker spoke about in your previous podcast. Um, yeah, so trying to have some sort of balanced package, I think it would be part of the wider ambition, part of which would include uh, further thinking around Article 5. Jamie, uh, thank you very much. This has been a, a great conversation. Uh, we will see where it goes tomorrow. This is um, to serve as information to anyone who wishes uh, to watch it tomorrow, but uh, also in the future, and if anybody who wants to inform themselves and see um, how it fared, uh, uh, how reality uh, evolved, rather, uh, with the consultative uh, meeting scheduled. Um, you've mentioned science and technology review mechanisms, so I uh, use this opportunity to invite you again to come uh, to the Diplomacy Light podcast, uh, where we discuss specifically this. It's one of the important possible outcomes uh, that may come out uh, of the, this review conference process. Uh, and uh, I, I think it is important to really understand uh, all the details around it. With that, uh, thank you very much again for um, both the, the live discussion that we had in Vienna when we met up and uh, continuing it uh, here.
Thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be able to join you. And I'm always happy to talk BWC. So I, I look forward to seeing you speaking on this in due course. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, this has been a Diplomacy Light podcast.